Talk with Two Boss Chicks. I'm your host, Crystal, and today we're going to be reviewing the classic 1984 version of Nightmare on Elm Street, directed by Wes Craven, starring the late, great John Saxon. The kids of Elm Street don't know it yet, but something is coming to get them. There's something out there, isn't there? <laughs> First of all, let's give our props up to John Saxon. This man has been in so many good movies. He, you know, he's one of those actors that you see in a movie and you just know that he is going to give you that knockout performance. He lived a long life. But 2020 has just been one of those years where, you know, it's been the death of many things. Uh, particularly uh, filmmaking uh, when it comes to the major studios because COVID has just kind of knocked us all on our butts. But we're going to get back up again and start filming again. But let's talk about Nightmare on Elm Street. First of all, this is Russell Craven's classic. And he's done plenty of classics, but the original Nightmare on Elm Street is just something special about this film because it is the perfect blend of horror and straight up comedy. I think this is one of the first films that realized you can make things that are scary funny at the same time. Um, and Robert England, he just takes it to a whole nother level with his interpretation of Freddy Krueger. So let's talk about some of the things that were funny in this movie. You know, just to kind of begin on a high note since we are mourning the loss of John Saxon. So many things um, that are funny on purpose and then funny uh, probably by accident. So one of the things, the movie starts off with Tina having this nightmare about Freddy. And Tina is literally in a shirt draws walking outside in a dark alley who knows what's on the ground and she's you know just walking around like she actually has on clothes and number two freddy comes out and he has these accordion arms, and it's just so ridiculous. He's scraping the sides of the wall. And we all hate that sound of, you know, nails on a chalkboard and stuff. And so they use that uh, pretty frequently in this film because it makes you cringe. And horror is something that, you know, directors want to make the audience cringe. And one of the funny things is that Tina's running from him because Freddie's chasing her. And he says, hey, wait, check this out. And Tina turns around and gives him her full attention. No clothes on. It watches him cut his finger off before she keeps running back to the house. Um, I just don't know too many people who will be running from, you know, um, an attacker. And would just straight up give him, turn around, give him their full attention and wait for them to, you know, Put on a show and Freddie he likes to cut his nipple off it's just all types of crazy stuff that had me completely dying rolling Freddie is you know honestly he could have been just a straight up stand-up comedian Freddie when uh Nancy tries to call her boyfriend and uh Freddie's mouth becomes the mouthpiece of the phone and he licks her lips and he says I'm your boyfriend now Classic, hilarious. We, you know, <laughs> we do that line all the time amongst my friends, you know. Uh, it's just hilarious. Tina's death. Woo! Okay, so her getting spent around the air is kind of funny because it's like, what in the world is going on? But the part that's really funny is her boyfriend, who is in the room, scared 
turns on a light and gets smacked on the ground while he's wearing these tiny whiteies. And it's like, <laughs> it's so ridiculous. And it's hilarious. We love it. One of the parts that literally takes me out every time is when Nancy has her breakdown in the classroom. And I just noticed for the first time that the teacher is the, the, the old lady from Insidious. I don't know why I didn't, maybe I didn't know that before, but I haven't watched the original Nightmare on Elm Street in a while. I've watched the remake more recently than the 1984 version. But I was like, yeah, she's always doing this. Yeah, we love her. You know, she was a young, fresh teacher inspiring her students uh, in this particular film. But um, that freak out that Nancy has when she's having that nightmare and she wakes up all frantic and crazy. And that black man's face that is sitting in front of her is completely priceless. I mean, it is so funny. The whole, the whole freak out is funny. But his face by itself really just, it, 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 it kills me every time. So let's get into some of the themes from this movie. Because this, this movie, honestly, as funny as it was, as ridiculous as you may think it is, it actually has some food for thought in it. So, a couple of things. Um, one being the whole theme of your dreams and, you know, the importance of them and just what do they actually mean? You know, I think dreams are something that, um, you know, particularly back then, we didn't really pay attention. So, oh, it's just a dream, it's just a dream. Versus now, I feel like when people have dreams, you people give it a little bit more weight um, than I think before. So uh, that's something that has definitely changed. I have seen um, throughout the years as you know, this film has aged. That whole thing about dreams and Freddie was so scary, even though he was funny, he was really scary as a kid because it's like I can't go to sleep. Like that is that is that is something that is really scary for someone who loves sleep like i love sleep the theme of taking your dreams seriously and then also the theme of turning your back on negative energy that was something that um nancy kind of figured out as you know she kept having these dreams and experiences with freddie is that the more power and fear that you give over to these negative energies these negative dreams these nightmares the more power that they're going to have over you. And so when you realize that, you can overcome it through taking that power back. And that's the line that Nancy says at the end where she's like, you know, I take back every ounce of power and fear I gave to you. Because you're nothing. You're absolutely nothing. And Freddie tries to kill her and he can't because she has taken all that power from him. And that's something that I think people in general need to... Um, take hold of that that is um good advice for anybody and that's coming from a, a horror film is to not give those negative energies um that that really are detrimental to your life and your well-being that power and it's you know anyone who's you know continues to watch the nightmare elm street series with freddie you know that's one of the ways that they eventually get rid of him even in um you know the later installments like the the Freddy versus Jason um, movie in which, you know, Freddy, they didn't say his name because, you know, they didn't want to give that negative energy any power at all. So there is power in your thoughts. There's power in what you speak into existence. So, you know, being mindful of that, not giving into that is something that we all need to do, especially in today's time. Another thing that was that this particular installment of Nightmare on Elm Street doesn't get into, but it kind of hints to is uh freddy krueger being a pedophile child killer you don't necessarily get the pedophile part in this installment but in the 2010 version the re-release of it or the reboot of it we definitely see that one of the things that we see in the 1984 version is you know the revelation of the fact that the parents uh you know they found out that freddie was one who you know was responsible for these kids in the neighborhood coming up missing and you know 
trial for these things and you know because of the technicality somebody didn't sign a warrant in the right way the justice system you know failed the community and freddie got no consequence for his actions and so the parents themselves decided to take action and kill him um to you know rid themselves of this basically this plague that was killing the kids and as i you know Watch that particular scene where that revelation came out. I began to think about their actions and if it's justified. Would I advocate for the same thing? And I'm telling you, um, pedophiles are like an absolute no for me. Like that decision that they made to burn him up, I, I may not have gone that far and burned people up, but getting deciding like hey we need to actually get rid of him i would have been on board with that i'm not sure how i would have did it but that is something that that's that's a, that's a, that's a real deal problem and particularly in our society we see particularly men but women to get away with these types of crimes against children with no consequence. And so these parents, I honestly gotta say I applaud them because I feel like any real parent would have been like, yeah, because the police, the justice system is not gonna help us. So we have to help ourselves. And you know, a lot of times that ends up happening um, in many situations with people but they have to take the law in their own hands because the law does not deliver justice. Also, another thing is that, you know, you can't keep secrets from your children. You know, um, killing Freddie was something, I mean, obviously that's not something you want to tell your kids to kill somebody. But um, the secret ended up ruining his head anyway. And I felt like they really kind of took too long to really tell them what the deal was if, if you know um they had of actually if, if, one of the things that we really kind of saw i think overall is there was a, a a lack of communication between the parents and the children um and we still see that today where you know parents are doing their thing the kids doing their own thing and i think that whole kind of separatism in the family is a lot of times what causes a lot of detrimental issues to arise because you know the kids don't know how to you know communicate with their parents and the parents don't know how to communicate with the kids and so there's always this kind of this gap in their relationship and so when there's an issue where both need to come together and work it out they have to get over this you know try to jump over this gap here before they can really get to communicating and that gap was there um with this whole secret um and i just think in general the, their communication with that I mean, even nancy and her dad like they just were not on the same page nancy and her mom were not on the same page and so this is the you know lesson to parents you know talk to your kids i mean if, if one of the things i think is is important you know we're dealing with dreams you know talk to your kids about their dreams how will you how would you not what did you dream about you know, this is something that can really kind of open up deep communication and allow, you know, parents to really uh, commune with their children on a deeper level. So when they, you know, have these types of, you know, personal issues, because Nancy didn't even want to tell her mom about what was going on with her. She was lying a lot of times. She was, you know, hiding stuff in her room, you know, not wanting her mom to know stuff. And the mom was hiding stuff too, trying to hide her alcohol bottle. So um, this movie really just kind of shows how you really need to open up communication. Um, John Saxon's character, he was a good strong, I think he was a pretty, a pretty typical dad. You know, he is, you know, all about the facts, it's all about, you know, doing things, you know, the right way, particularly his way. Um, he was a, a lieutenant or sheriff or something to that effect. He was all about law and order. Um, and so this particular situation 
it was difficult for him to, to deal with, but his um his interaction with his daughter I think was very realistic. His acting was I think superb when it comes to that. Um and he just has a very distinct look that um it's like he can kind of see through the bullshit. So I really just uh I like him being cast in this role. I think he he was casting a lot of, you know, other roles that were similar to this one. I no nonsense, kind of hard. Yeah, but compassionate, you know, at the same time. So, um, but if I had to give this movie a rating, because it's a classic, you can't give it anything other than a ten out of ten. It's there's no other way. Okay, what's Craven? Not here with Seymour John Saxon. Not here with Morgan. There's no way I can give this movie less than a ten. It's just not happening. It's a great. It's it's a comedy. Or you can't get any better than this. Um, I definitely recommend you watch this. And then I also recommend you watch the 2010 version. Just to kind of, not just to compare, but to really just kind of get a full picture of uh, who Freddie is. So like, um, they both were, were equally um, well done. I particularly think the 2010 version is a lot more on the like, creepy kind of horror side. Versus um, the uh, 1984 version is more of a, uh, a lighthearted type of horror. So, but that's all we have for you today. Thank y'all for tuning in, and make sure you stay tuned for our other episodes. We need to do more classic movies.